Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we just come past two o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome everybody to the Scenes of Shame and Stigma in COVID-19 seminar series. Um, and this is the third seminar in the series we've organized this year. It's um, connected to our UKRI AHRC funded project, um, Scenes of Shame and Stigma in COVID-19. And I'm really delighted today to welcome um, Nikita Simpson um, and also Laura Bear, who's not able to come because of um, health issues. She's not here today, but Nikita is going to present their work on um, Laura's behalf. And um, I'll just in briefly introduce you to both of them, even though Laura's not here. Laura is a professor of anthropology at the London School of Economics and a participant in the Scientific Pandemic Influenza Group on Behaviours and the Ethnicity Subgroup of SAGE and Independent SAGE. She leads the LSE COVID and Care Research Group. And Nikita um, is an anthropologist whose PhD um, from the LSE is focused on stigma, mental distress and illness amongst tribal women in Northern India. Um, she's coordinator of the LSE's COVID and Care Research Group and joint head of research at the SHM Foundation. And we're really excited to hear from um, Nikita today. Um, their talk is entitled Building Cooperation, New Relations of Stigma and Mutuality in the UK's COVID-19 Recovery. Um, and um, our research team has been following their work quite closely and reading their reports. So we're really thrilled to hear more about the work that they've been doing um, in the UK during COVID. So I'll hand it over to Nikita now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luna, and thank you everyone for being here. It's so wonderful to have um, such a great audience for this work that we uh, have been doing now for the last 18 months. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I am a researcher at the LSE, an anthropologist, and I work together with Professor Laura Baer and have done since those very early days in April 2020 when the deaths um, from COVID-19 were really going up very quickly. Um, and uh, at that time, um, a group of researchers at LSE were asked to do an anthropological study of how we can actually best deal with the excess death um, uh, during the pandemic. And so we, our first kind of foray into policy focused research was a very rapid ethnographic study of um, death and attitudes towards what a good death is um, during a, a situation of radical rupture like the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and you can read about that in a BMJ article that we published, but from that research grew a research group called the COVID, COVID and Care Research Group who are mainly anthropologists at the LSE, but also colleagues from Cambridge, uh, uh, from uh, oh, UCL, uh, many places, um, who are cross-generational um, and uh, also include engagement of participant researchers um, or citizen anthropologists, we call them, uh, filmmakers um, and uh, other kind of um, community organizational partners. Uh, our group has really been focused on engaging directly with national and local policy groups um, over the last, uh, uh, yeah, 18 months. Um, and we've worked very closely with the um, MHCLG, uh, with the uh, local authorities in um, Leicester uh, and various boroughs of London and in Kirklees uh, and in Boston. Um, and we've also worked very closely with a number of community-based organizations who um, are addressing uh, COVID-19 related issues. Um, now, this presentation today that I'm going to give is related to a slice of, of um, our group's research that Laura and I have uh, led that's related to stigma and relations of mutuality. Um, and it's particularly going to draw on a case study uh, of Leicester, where I've conducted interviews um, in two rounds and, and a number of surveys, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but yeah, let's get started. I'm just going to put a timer on so I'm not... <laughs> Um, oh, so I don't go over time, but okay. So um, 
What we found in our research um, over the last 18 months is that the COVID-19 pandemic has signified a radical and acute disruption of our relationships of care and community. On one hand, people have built their own new connections and forms of mutuality in order to meet their needs. But on the other, these sources of support are not open to all, and there are significant barriers in accessing them for many. Indeed, government policies in some cases have not always worked to build connection, but often produced new forms of disconnection, exclusion, stigma and inequality. Despite ongoing attempts to build an evidence base and a policy conversation around issues of stigma in, with all of these various partners that I mentioned, we've seen the issue largely ignored. Instead, we see it as a kind of open secret where such new relations of stigma related to COVID-19 shape all of our daily interactions and choices and erupt in forms of avoidance, blame or violence. We've tracked how they are manifest in daily behavior for different groups and how they have certain legacies around groups and in certain places. So in this talk, I'm going to begin by defining the particular anthropological approach that we take to stigma. Then I'll move into an account of our methods that we've used and present some specific findings from a case study of our work in Leicester and some of our, our national survey findings. And at the end, I'm going to open up a discussion around the policy implications of this kind of work and how we're taking it forward um, into our new program of research. Um, so I think probably a lot of you can, can cover this better than I can, um, but uh, foundational studies of stigma have focused on intergroup dynamics and social cohesion. Existing studies are in psychology and behavioral science related to pandemics seek often to understand epidemiological risk in pandemics as individual or, and graded by socio-demographic variables. There are more relational perspectives that are often applied using qualitative methods that aim to look at people's perceptions and fears that drive behavior, particularly, for example, a great literature related to um, the Ebola epidemic. And these really help us to answer questions about compliance to regulations and to determine levels of trust in sources of authority. Conclusions highlight that people should be engaged based on their demographic group and focus on community mobilization. Such, <clears throat> such approaches help us to open up the black box of stigma in these uncertain times. But the problem that we as anthropologists might find with such approaches is that they're firstly based on a homogenous idea of community that doesn't account for intersecting inequalities that exist prior to moments of uncertainty. That they are often based on a binary notion of health knowledge as compliance or misconception and that sometimes they have a flat and cyclical notion of trust in government or in authority. Now, by contrast, anthropological studies of what happens in communities during times of radical rupture, like pandemics, reveal that assumptions that are made about demographic and attitudinal characteristics are often wrong or unstable, and that people develop complex imaginations of authority and legitimacy that are often based on people science or rumor. By contrast, an anthropological approach would aim to track the behavior of people as members of a collective networks of care, both formal and informal. An anthropological approach does not assume that such networks are built on romantic and inclusive notions of care or homogenous notions of community or demographic, but that care and community is complex, ambivalent and tied up with one's position in the life course and household. Now, how does this play out in relation to stigma? As people attempt to stabilize the radically uncertain present, to avoid transmission and to protect their loved ones, they're forced to make constant evaluations of what, where, and who is considered safe or unsafe. Such evaluations, mitigating and managing risk, force people to build boundaries against certain external people, places, or groups that they consider to be risky based on stereotypes and assumptions. Some of these stereotypes and assumptions are old and grounded in historical formations of exclusion, but some are new and generated in these moments of uncertainty uh, and often articulated through complex symbols. Any community of care is likely to have exclusions in social figures who are seen as other or in the situation of a pandemic 
dangerous to include in infrastructures of provisioning and support. But similarly, institutions often define particular groups as inherently problematic, turning the effects of disadvantage into a judgment on essential identities of communities. And just to just to pause for a second and tell you that some of the photographs that um, come uh, run through this presentation are by a collaborator of ours called Gray Hutton and were taken during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, okay, so what is our particular approach, theoretical uh, approach um, to stigma? Uh, to understand how stigma plays out in this context, we argue that we require a notion of stigma that is not just social or relational, but is actually moral. Understanding what is at stake for people and the range of symbolic languages that are used to express and register difference. This is rooted in a literature, understanding intersecting forms of class, caste, gender tri and tribal difference as they articulated through embodied formulations. We draw particularly on literature from South Asia where this um, work is very rich and where difference is experienced in and through bodily substances and their avoidance. <coughs> But structure is not synchronic and difference is not stable, especially in times of crisis. Hence, to add to this, we also require a more sophisticated idea of time. How do we think about moments of rupture, impasse and aporia and the means by which people attempt to stabilise their realities through speculative technologies? Now, bringing these two literatures together, we pursue a notion of stigma as biomoral and examine the open secret of stigma as it played out in UK national policymaking and in microcosms such as Leicester. Applying this to the UK context, we see that policymakers and populations are operating within deep uncertainties and insecurities given the lack of scientific knowledge about COVID-19 that such uncertainty and sense of risk produces boundary making narratives and complex symbols at regional and household levels as people seek security. This means people divide the world often into people who are risk givers or spreaders of the virus and risk takers or those who are vulnerable to such spread, a perception of risk that can work to polarize, exclude and stigmatize. Now I'm just gonna turn here to the kind of methods that we use to pursue this kind of biomoral notion of stigma. Um, so the, the particular model that we have used is a multi-team, multi-sited ethnography um, that began in this experiment that we did uh, during the first wave, <coughs> as I mentioned, related to death. We've built this out uh, to what we hope is an exemplar model for the systemic integration of rapid ethnographic research into the emergency response and social policy making <coughs> excuse me, at national and local policy levels. We see the strengths of ethnographic methods when deployed rapidly can include careful attention to the effects of specific contexts within which policies might be embedded, <coughs> simultaneous awareness of how practices in a particular time and place are connected to economic, political and historical forces and a close attention to the encounters with uh, local bureaucrats in government or healthcare workers um, that uh, uh, in which stigma is articulated. So methodologically, our model has at its core involved a multi-sided large team of researchers, um, often with existing links to different parts um, of the UK and different particular groups in the UK, um, who've conducted ongoing ethnographic research over the past 18 months, um, and particularly a focused ethnographic and, and semi-structured interview research based on a common rubric um, uh, in two phases uh, over the summer last year and um, in the first three months of this year. Uh, we take a maybe counterintuitive approach to surveys where we've used those ethnographic insights in order to scale up, um, uh, 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 to build surveys that allow us to scale upwards from these microcosms um, that we've been looking at. And then we look um, outwards and deeply into communities using citizen anthropological methods such as creative design workshops, peer interviewing, participatory film filmmaking and photo voice. Uh, for example, at the moment we're making a film with a group of um, Somali women in Birmingham, we're also uh, 
uh, conducting an ongoing research project with um, uh, Leaders Unlocked, a group of young uh, researchers across the UK who are pursuing a young people's perspective to these issues. Um, so what does this provide us? Um, we, from this methodology, we are able to obtain a relational approach um, uh, to uh, stigma. We are able to capture the impact of policy decisions on mental distress across networks of family and community and capture the different types of stresses and modes of coping and building resilience across axes of age, gender, race and ethnicity. We do this by mapping the networks of care that our interlocutors have and identifying pinch points where certain social roles are particularly absorbing relations of stigma or building relations of connection. So, for example, the domestic was a really important space for us, um, looking at how stigma was articulated across the boundary making in the domestic, who was allowed in, who made the decisions about who was allowed in. We also saw um, kind of particular community spaces um, as really important in, in these practices, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and we kind of scaled up from those networks of care through, as I mentioned, a survey of 3.8 thousand <coughs> respondents in June 2020 and 2.2 thousand respondents um, in May this year. And here's just an example of what one of our care maps might look like. So today I'm also gonna speak directly to a Leicester case study we did, which is just one of a number of deep case studies uh, we've done across the UK, which you can read about in our report um, that I can post in the chat later, um, where I've done uh, 23 semi-structured interviews across a range of districts in Leicester uh, city and counties, um, divided into two rounds last year in the summer and earlier this year. Um, interviewers, uh, interviewees uh, described themselves as members of Hindu, Christian, Sikh and Muslim faith, group, faith groups with um, people of white British, Indian, East African Indian and Sri Lankan ethnic backgrounds. And here, this is where we really hope to dig under the kind of uh, BAME category as it's been used as a catch-all over the last 18 months, um, which I'll speak to a little later. Um, respondents also included uh, were often these kind of uh, nodal figures, so figures who um, see across a variety of networks of care. So um, these aren't necessarily community leaders as such, but they're figures who are really deeply embedded in um, various networks. So they might include local councillors, trade union representatives, faith leaders, third sector workers, small business owners, um, university lecturers and carers representatives. Um, we also conducted a survey uh, earlier in um, uh, Ju July last year with 550 uh, Leicester respondents, um, but that was uh, primarily captured white British respondents. <coughs> and we disaggregated our two nation nationwide surveys um, for the Leicester respondents, which produced really interesting responses. Okay, so um, moving on briefly to our findings, um, to begin with, uh, stigma we realised when we did um, our first round of ethnographic work is often expressed through the ways in which people try to avoid people, places and groups that are considered unsafe, um, or in this case, sources of transmission, or ho have a lot of people who they see as non-compliant to um, rules, not following the rules. Um, and what we found uh, was that people were 32% of respondents indicated that they avoided certain parts of their local area, 20% indicated that they have changed where they go shopping, 24% indicated that they avoid meeting certain groups or people like crowds and tourists. And when we dig deeper into some of the uh, free text responses, we realized that these were often related to certain groups that they uh, believe to be living in that, um, for example, young people um, or people of certain ethnic minority groups um, or of certain faith groups. So so often they couldn't explain the link between the avoidance um, and the uh, uh, um, uh, characteristics of the people who they were trying to avoid. Um, so that, that's where the kind of biomoral perspective really um, sheds a lot of light. 
And so we dig deeper into who these minority groups were and how they were experiencing these relations of stigma. Were they internalizing such relations? Were they anticipating them themselves? And we revealed that um, stigma has been experienced significantly, particularly by groups who have um, uh, experienced high rates of transmission in their communities. So um, we particularly looked at the Bangladeshi and Pakistani groups across the UK who experienced severe mortality um, uh, and also Somali groups um, who also experienced high mortality rates. <coughs> they also experienced stigma as blame for non-compliance. They experienced it as an inability or hesitancy in accessing healthcare, in perceived poor treatment in healthcare, in poor treatment by employers, in the inability to self-isolate, often related to um, having employers who wouldn't provide them with self-isolation payments or being unable to access those payments or uh, thinking that um, the uh, payments were not for people like them. Um, and kind of one of the things we found most interesting was that people uh, experienced this stigma as a lack of data and evidence about what was going on in their communities. So people felt abandoned um, and they felt unseen um, uh, by the uh, system uh, in the last 18 months. And they made very strong demands of us um, and of their local authorities in the forums that we audited um, to build a better evidence base around how people have suffered in their communities. Um, and they saw that as a, as a relation of stigma. Um, so, uh, and also a relation of trauma, which, which I think is something that we'd like to develop um, uh, our understanding of as we pursue further research um, into the next year. Um, some of the key stigmatizing policies that minoritized groups experienced were um, uh, government communications around intervention in Eid and Ramadan celebrations in 2020, and inconsistency in local authority regulations around Eid in 2021. Um, uh, also, uh, don't have it on this slide, but on inconsistencies in, in um, uh, regulations around death and burial, particularly before our first report um, in uh, the very early days of March and April in 2020. Um, then the other big marker point that people told us about was uh, uh, the Sewell report, um, uh, which uh, was perceived as denying ongoing structural racism, particularly against uh, Afro-Caribbean and Black British groups who've reported long-term negative of, uh, impacts of the publication of that report. We also heard a lot from African and African British, um, uh, British African groups who are often key workers, care workers or healthcare workers um, who responded with fe reported feelings of abandonment, um, particularly around inadequate PPE um, compared to their white colleagues. Um, so these were just, this is just a slice of some of the kinds of stigmatizing policies, policies that produce new relations of stigma as experienced by these minoritized groups. <coughs> One of the um, key groups, as I mentioned, we've we've looked at um, our Bangladeshi and Pakistani groups um, during the second wave, and you can read more deeply about this um, in a report that Laura uh, led uh, for the ethnicity subgroup um, uh, in March this year, uh, which was trying to understand data around the extremely high mortality um, in all ethnic groups uh, in the second wave, but highest being highest for Bangladeshi and Pakistani groups. Um, and here we, we really looked at the um, uh, amplifying and intersecting effects of long-term health inequities, disadvantages associated with exposing occupations and overcrowding uh, or inadequate housing conditions. Um, barriers to accessing healthcare, which are often the effects of such policies um, and relations of internalized stigma, and uh, the potential influence of policy and practice on COVID-19 health seeking behavior. So how we can kind of overcome these relationships of stigma by acknowledging these long-term health inequities. Um, and here we come to uh, the real need to invest in uh, in building cooperation through a social infrastructures approach, which I will um, touch on in the end of this uh, presentation. But I just want to turn now to our case study of Leicester. Um, now, Leicester, we see as a really important case study as it illustrates the impact of localized social restrictions on the perception of a place in the national imagination, on the self-perception of local residents impacted by the lockdown and on their way of life. Um, 
Leicester was the first area of national intervention in June 2021. And in our first surveys that we did before we even did uh, uh, any very specific and disaggregated work there, there was a kind of cross community perspective um, that Leicester was being seen as a plague city that people, I don't know if you've read that uh, there were some amazing um, and very harrowing uh, newspaper articles about people seeing themselves as the lepers of Leicester. And we've seen that the persistent legacy of that stigma play out in different ways um, over the last 15 months. Um, in 2021, when we went back and did research, we saw that the social divides that had opened and intensified during the summer of 2020 had shifted in alignment with new geopolitical events. So we were really able to kind of uh, add, as I, as I mentioned before, this kind of temporal dimension about how these relations of stigma fluctuate um, and take on or absorb different forms of exclusion that were playing out um, in uh, people's diaspora that are uh, countries, um, in kind of broader geopolitical events, in um, issues that went on in national parliament. Um, so people who live in Leicester City, uh, in the densely populated neighbourhoods of the city, especially St Matthews, Spinning Hills and Highfields, have been concerned right the way through um, with ongoing narratives of transmission related to housing conditions, intergenerational living arrangements and urban environments. Um, the communities who live in these places are primarily from lower class uh, South Asian and Black African backgrounds. Um, they've relied on existing networks to support each other rather than looking outwardly for support from formal care providers. Um, and this bolsters the perception of spread as located within these closed communities where formal care services are finding it difficult to reach out to communities who are not digitally connected, have poor English skills or literacy barriers. And this contributes to this idea that such communities are bounded and hard to reach, uh, a term that they strongly resist, um, and also to the location of uh, the stigmatization of whole groups as um, sources of transmission are related to inherent characteristics around them from an institutional perspective. Um, now, in our surveys uh, and in our interviews, we picked up on significant divides between the city and counties in Leicester that intersect with divides between white and South Asian or Black British groups, and also class divides um, between those who work in the uh, lower class factory or textile businesses and those who um, are uh, dependent on more service economy jobs. Um, this uh, was significantly related to uh, divides related to Brexit, um, related to um, uh, the general election that had uh, opened new fissures in the community um, prior to COVID. Um, and there's a particularly stigmatizing perception from non-Asian interlocutors that particular areas are populated by Asian communities who have not behaved themselves in the city center, where such non-compliance is perceived to be associated with occupation, um, where groups are seen to be <coughs> impoverished, uh, badly paid and forced to work. But the respondents were also quick to suggest that white people have also broken rules. So you see that there's this kind of uh, fluctuating moral narrative um, around stigmatizing such areas. We saw that uh, the multi-generational household kind of crystallized as one of these complex symbols um, of stigma that was capricious enough to not um, uh, uh, be associated with any one particular group, but specific enough to articulate a variety of class, gendered and ethnic stigmas. Um, there was a strong narrative about conditions of overcrowding in multi-generational households in certain parts of Leicester as producing ongoing transmission and a kind of model minority narrative about those who had worked hard enough to uh, leave those places versus those who stayed there. But then there was a really strong counter narrative that we picked up on as well about networks and care and support that have allowed certain cultural groups to manage um, through the pandemic and provide important relationships of care. So it was the very networks that allowed these communities to be strong that were the source of stigma externally and internalized stigma. Um, 
Another really strong part of the Leicester Stigma story is the garment factories, which you might have read about in um, July 2020, that became, again, one of these kind of complex symbols um, of stigma and a, a real source of kind of national fury. Um, there was an uh, uh, there, this ongoing stigma, uh, uh, this, there was an ongoing scandal about in, in legal garment factory work as a vector of transmission um, that really animated the popular imagination um, and uh, was a very racialized uh, narrative, um, particularly related to uh, Bangladeshi and uh, some Punjabi migrants. However, um, there was a strong pushback in interviews we did within these communities that these people don't want to continue to work in such exploitative conditions during a pandemic, but that um, a, a, dis, a disintegration of um, health and safety uh, uh, standards and um, infrastructures uh, during the previous decade of austerity meant that there was no way of um, regulating uh, these kind of factory spaces. Um, uh, and that kind of went both for illegal garment factories, but also to accusations of transmission in big factories such as Walkers and Sandwich Brothers Sandwiches um, uh, and their inadequate conditions of work. There was also a really strong counter narrative that um, this was a particularly stigmatizing story for South Asian women who often worked between both in the garment factory and in the household and had this kind of dual role and were doubly stigmatized by their work and the fact that they were bringing bringing COVID home to their families. Um, so we also picked up on significant ethnic and religious divides uh, between uh, communities. Um, particularly uh, circulated through rumor um, uh, and through misinformation spread through WhatsApp. Um, these were often articulated around places of worship where there were a lot of accusations of uh, secret prayer meetings. Um, but then this was kind of countered by an argument that um, there was a need to continue to uh, have religious meetings as a kind of hidden litmus test of religiosity, as one interlocutor told me. Um, many told me that they avoided certain shops and businesses uh, in order to avoid catching COVID-19 along religious lines. And there was a frustration at the lack of comparable support for the government for uh, one community compared to another. Um, so, so what was really important, uh, I saw was that these dynamics of stigma, particularly within and between uh, communities um, along gendered, ethnic, religious divides could not be separated from people's own narratives of their positionality within colonial flows um, and waves of migration, uh, the economic history of the fall of Leicester textile mills and the rise of the illegal rag trade, and the more recent political history of voting patterns shaken up by geopolitical events, particularly the rise of Hindu nationalism, which played out in um, certain uh, uh, pro uh, problematic or perceived as problematic decisions made by the government around Kashmir, um, the Palestinian occupation, and more recently, the farmers' protests, um, and also recent policy changes in Brexit and particularly the prevent policy. <coughs> So um, I'm coming to the last bit of my talk here where I want to kind of open up a wider policy uh, conversation. Um, so the kind of direct implications of our research in Leicester uh, revealed that it was really necessary to have an open dialogue about the potential dangers of providing community-led care and how to overcome these. And we tried to do this by working directly in tandem with the local authority, with the comms team, with um, uh, Public Health England uh, in Leicester itself, particularly during the first wave where we were kind of picking up on some of these perceptions and feeding them back into a team in weekly meetings, um, but also to engage uh, a more open dialogue at national policy level about the ways in which communities were being imagined um, and how the ways they were being imagined had stigmatizing effects. Um, we also saw a key policy implication being the necessary acknowledgement of the ways in which national interventions and policy debates during the pandemic have intensified stereotypes um, <coughs> and how these have 
ongoing legacies beyond the COVID-19 moment. Um, we also saw uh, a necessity of education among healthcare professionals of the different effects of stigmatizing experiences on health outcomes um, at, because significantly uh, many of our interlocutors told us that they uh, as I said at the beginning, experienced um, or perceived to experience poorer care as a result of their ethnic group. Um, uh, uh, but finally, um, we saw that there was a really important acceptance and address of the deep and long term health inequalities related to minority and disadvantaged statuses. So all of these together. Um, lead us to a kind of conclusion that we've pursued in our latest report and that we are pursuing as a program of research over the next two years as part of Periscope, um, which is to integrate, to take a social infrastructures approach to policy. Um, now, social infrastructures are networks, or we define social infrastructures as, as networks of relationships in which people are embedded in their homes and their communities. Uh, so of informal care, um, relationships of formal care, health and political relationships with institutions and with society, processes of connection and uh, disconnection, stigma, trust and hope, the forms of mutuality and ex exploitation people experience in the workplace um, uh, and uh, in community groups, and also the relations to the non-human or the built environment. Um, so we see social infrastructures as a window into capturing the kind of intersecting ways in which stigma uh, needs to be factored into policymaking um, uh, and to look at the impact of health disparity and during transmission um, to understand how policies land in kind of uh, complex and historically laden uh, uh, context of exclusion and um, fragmentation or uh, hope or uh, whatever it is, and to also understand the in unintended effects of policies um, as they play out. Um, so we see a number of things as really important um, uh, in thinking about social infrastructures in relation to, to policy making. We see social infrastructures as not just out there to be tapped into. A social infrastructure is not just like a homogenous bounded community that should be engaged through a, um, a community leader or chief, but they're networks that are impacted by policies and socioeconomic conditions. Um, if policies don't take social infrastructures into account, there can be serious unintended negative consequences, which is really what we picked up on in these relationships with stigma, where um, policies contravene values, appear immoral or don't make sense. They undermine coping mechanisms or intensify inequalities within them, or they create new burdens like they have particularly for women during this pandemic, doing some things that the state should be doing and not communities. But if they do take social infrastructures into account, we believe we can build co-production, better distributive outcomes and legitimacy for policy um, and prevent the stigmatizing effects. Um, so what kinds of in interventions are we talking about? Um, we're talking about initiatives that communicate solidarity and work with social infrastructures at their core. So these are pragmatic interventions based on local understandings of problems of access. So I think the vaccination program and tackling stigma around vaccination was a really important example of this. Um, we worked with Ealing Council to develop their vaccination um, engagement policy and to understand vaccination hesitancy and to implement really specific things in vaccination centres or where they were or how people talked in order to um, kind of tackle those forms of hesitancy. We also think that forms of national level interventions that take community and household networks and their sustenance into account is, is crucial. You know, networks that understand care uh, or policies that understand and sustain care and particularly unpaid forms of caring labor. Um, uh, Thirdly, uh, resources to support ease of access. Um, so understanding what the barriers of accessing healthcare or food security or um, other forms of formal care are and um, understanding how they might be uh, overcome through uh, future investment. And finally, um, investment in non-human environments. Um, so particularly uh, understanding how built infrastructures are really, and, and their lack of really prevent people from um, uh, uh, having positive health outcomes. So one, uh, to, to just end on a final example um, of uh, a, 
a policy that we've been working on um, and particularly Laura has been working on is the community champions policy. So you can read about a, a brief that she wrote um, for the government on this in two, 2020. Um, and you can also uh, listen to uh, a talk that we had um, at the LSE uh, in July uh, that had some of the key MHCLG policymakers um, around community champions. So here we're really looking at what the different kinds of investment in, uh, in uh, individuals who are these kind of nodal figures in communities can do in order to um, uh, engage uh, their uh, communities, um, in order to feed back um, key insights related to stigma and exclusion, and in order to advocate for the right kinds of investment in their local social infrastructures are. So watch this space. This is something that we'll be really developing out in the next um, couple of months. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to end there because I'd really love to uh, open up a discussion. You know, this is a slice of our research. We have lots of people working on this and um, uh, we're very open to um, new ideas around this for the next stage. Um, just want to yeah, mention that uh, these credits, illustration by Maggie Lee and photos by Gray, as well as our amazing ethnographic com contributions across the LSE and our um, funding support from the LSE and the Periscope project. Um, so thank you so much and uh, thanks so much for listening. Well, wow, thank you, Nikita. Thank you for that really rich and interesting talk. There's so much in it and um, yeah, so many, like just so many topics um, so span so many important, I guess, experiences that were going on um, during the pandemic. So we've got plenty of time for discussion and questions. And um, let me just put my screen into gallery view so I can see everyone um so if you if you want to you can turn your cameras on now if if you feel comfortable um and if anyone has a question maybe you could just use the raise hand um function on zoom and that will help me um can I just kick off with a question because you just mentioned at the end vaccine hesitancy and you guys doing some work with Ealing to um, address vaccine hesitancy amongst certain communities. And I, I, I just had a conversation with a journalist like yesterday who was asking me about um, shaming and stigmatizing people who, if, if this is from a US context, who don't take up vaccines and you know what, what in my opinion would be more effective. And I'd love to hear what, what you guys suggested or in that particular community, what worked. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think, one thing I've learned so much about this, this work um, over the last 12 months is that things change so rapidly, like these relations of stigma, you know, the, the kind of focus of who this kind of hesitant figure is or who the kind of non-compliant figure is changes really rapidly. And so the kind of slice of research that we did on vaccine hesitancy was very much in like January, February and a little bit into March this year. So the conversation was very different and the kinds of figures who were seen as hesitant was very different. Um, and actually, I think that the UK has done a really, really good job in kind of addressing those relations of stigma um, uh, over the last six months. So what we found, we did a lot of interviews, particularly in Southall, Ealing, Acton um, at that time, and we're also doing work in Leicester, um, but we were particularly working with the Leicester Health Inequalities Public Health people around vaccines. And um, we found that, uh, and we also audited a lot of kind of um, community forums um, around vaccine hesitancy. So uh, Islamic groups, um, Sikh groups, um, Hindu groups, and um, what we found was that hesitancy was was not often related to um, uh, outright kind of conspiracy or denial it was more often related to issues around care so we found for example that a lot of um, we did a lot of interviews with South Asian young grandmothers so often these women were responsible for um, a large a network of people who they were caring for during a difficult situation and they were also caring for someone who was very elderly um, and they were managing all those different rela um, uh, relations with doctors and different medications and things like that so from a perspective of I'm just thinking particularly of one interview I had with a woman who was a carer like that you know she told me um, 
you know, how do I know what the best decision is for my mother? You know, I, I have to look in. It's my responsibility as a daughter and as a carer to understand how this fits into a complex relationship, a set of relationships of care. And my family has given me the responsibility of making this decision for my mother. So how could I not be hesitant? Um, so there was those kind of figures. And I, I found that really interesting um, because I thought, you know, I would be like that with my grandmother, right? Like, and I'm not call, calling myself a vaccine hesitant person. Um, so who gets called a vaccine hesitant person, I think is, is a very racialized thing um, or was a very racialized thing at that point in the conversation. Um, I think there were other kind of hesitant figures who had really experienced historical abandonment and like deeply problematic um, interactions with healthcare systems. So I found that a lot in black British communities um, uh, who had, yeah, really just uh, had very poor relationships with um, healthcare and who felt really unprovided for. And they were saying to me things like, why would I go and do this now when nobody's ever cared about my health before? Um, so, uh, you know, now I just have to do it for the white people, right? So, so that was a kind of quite strong activist voice in that group that, that I heard doing kind of some ethnographic work right through the latter parts of um, uh, 2020 and into early 2021. But I think what was really great was when they started to do like, so we were working in Ealing, right? And they, they were really careful and really ethnographic almost in the way in which they um, like diversified the vaccination strategy. So uh, doing pop-up clinics in mosques and temples was really important, I think. Um, doing kind of changing the specific locations of vaccination centers, um, and engaging farm, local pharmacies was really important. So really understanding you know, who are the trusted figures in that, those communities, what are the trusted spaces and how we can um, honor those uh, within this rollout. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know very much about vaccine hesitancy now. I think it's a kind of different beast at the moment, so. Yeah, and it certainly sounds like it's a different Kind of constellation of issues than perhaps in the US context from which this journalist was speaking um, that I was speaking to yesterday. But thank you, that was really interesting reflections. Um, and any other questions? I, I have more, so I can. Oh, yeah, Arthur? Yeah, I mean, this is this is kind of a tangential question. So so um, you know, pass it over if 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 needs be. But I I one of the things that I'm we we're, we're is in a in a research group meeting, chatting about um, particular cases. Uh, we're working with a sociologist and a and a um, and a uh, anesthesiologist and and we were talking about how particular events can 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 take an outsized kind of uh, relation in terms of policy impact right so so a kind of clear example for nhs trusts was um the mid staffordshire report in the mid 2000s which um radically which which kind of took this one trust that had had major issues with, with administration and then said that it really you needed to re shake up the whole trust system um the kind of equivalent is baby p in social in social uh in social work the way that that then really causes a massive shift in the way that social work is done and i was just wondering whether in Lester, when you were doing the work with these particular stories, which you which you really outlined um, quite quite beautifully, I mean, as a as a sort of person who works on literary narrative, it was really nice to see these stories in the midst of the in the midst of of, of your analysis um, and the way in which they they formed kind of as you say complex symbols, right? Because there was a there was a kind of narrative, but then when you went into the ethnographic detail, there was often a counter narrative. And I was just wondering whether um when you were when you were looking at those stories, they often 
related to quite specific circumstances that then had been kind of concertinaed or expanded out that meant that they then became it became as if they were exemplars for what were actually kind of exceptional circumstances yeah yeah it's a, that's a really it's a really interesting question and and i think it has significant methodological implications as well as like um substantive implications for what we found i mean people really wanted to talk about the garment factories um and that was because I think there were so many layers at which that um, that kind of issue played out on. You know, it played out on the level of like, like there were so many different stories related to it. So, for example, a trade unionist told me, if I asked about the garment factories, a trade unionist told me a very, very long term and complex story about how Leicester was, used to have be the city of golden streets and the textile mills had kind of fallen into disarray during the um, time of Margaret Thatcher and even before that. And that, you know, that was a vacuum that created a situation where an illegal economy was possible you know so there was this like really long durée history that he told me in this interview that was nominally related to COVID-19 right so this is what I'm trying to say with these kind of moments of with this need to fold in the kind of broader narratives of historical exclusion in order to understand um, the present and shifting relationship to stigma you know and another somebody else wanted to talk about how you know, uh, Punjabi brides were being brought over from India, not being told what situation they'd come into, have to then work in the garment factories and also work at home and couldn't go back to India or had too much pride to go back to India. You know, so you have these, yeah, these moments of rupture that were uh, um, kind of problematized by COVID and made visible by COVID that spoke to these kind of very fractured these relationships that were already fractured and um, already kind of part of the community's kind of, you know, moral panic. Um, but COVID kind of intensified those, or a non-human agent, you know, intensified those forms of exclusion. So that's why um, I think it was really important for me to look at Laura and I to look at this as a moral thing, because people told us moral stories, you know, they didn't, it, it wasn't like, you know, uh, it wasn't an attitude, like these weren't attitudes that people were talking about. They weren't even perceptions. The more important thing were these kind of much deeper stories of exclusion or kind of social inequity or um, uh, yeah, kind of abuse and exploitation that were then manifesting in an abandonment um, that were then manifesting in these. So, you know, not many people talked about COVID <laughs> or wanted to talk about COVID. But thank you. That's a really, a really great question and a really nice way maybe I can think about it as a, um, uh, in writing this up as a paper. Thanks, Arthur. Other questions? I might throw one of my other. Oh yeah, Des, go ahead. This is also a very tangential one, which is why I'm hesitating. But I mean, Nikita, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank, thanks, thanks so much for it. I guess I've kind of a half big question about anthropology, which if I feel, feel allowed, if there's other ethnographers in the room, I'd be interested in hearing their views too. And I guess you, you gestured at the kind of the very well known Ebola response uh, at the start of your talk, and there's, there's been others. And I guess I'm, I'm just interested in a moment of what feels like probably ongoing and rolling biological crisis, the kind of emergence and I would say a concretization of anthropology as a tool of epidemiological surveillance, I guess, or the kind of instrumentalization of ethnography as a, an epidemiological object quite explicitly attached to, you know, state instruments for the production of healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I just, I, it's just half baked because it doesn't know me on that. So my question is partly how do we, how to think about that as a problem in the kinds of, you know, in, in the midst of a, a, a very important project like the one you're doing. Um, because of course you're producing all this incredibly important and rich information on how stigma operates through these, you know, quite specific and hyper local social infrastructures. But I guess at the same time, and as, as you gestured at the end of your talk, making those social infrastructures both visible and available to centers of power, 
And then, of course, everyone's returning to Cambridge, UCL and LSE, which, of course, are centers of both intellectual and, and political power to kind of make those infrastructures visible to who and for what purpose and all those sorts mm -hmm. of things. So, um, yeah, how, how, how you know, I, I sometimes worry that kind of ethnographers are like we do power, but in a nice way, you know, and I just wonder yeah. how do we like avoid that in these what feels like this is not going to be a temporary crisis, right? This is kind of the future. So, you know, mm. what, 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 what do we do from here? Sorry, that's a lot. Yeah, no, I, it's a it's a really great question and one that we've thought about like in a lot of, you know, it's, it's kind of, because the reason why it was so great to have a group of scholar activists really of us in the, in the, in the COVID and care research group. I mean, most of us were young, right? We're not like serious professor people when most of us didn't have PhDs yet or anything like that. Um, so that kind of was a very pressing concern that we thought about as researchers before the pandemic, you know, do we go into academia? Do we do something else? Like, so this was kind of at the forefront of our, of our conversations and of our imagination. And the solution, I suppose we kind of came up with two solutions to this. The first was that this kind of discursive, critical conversation that we had as a group around any policy decision that we made and or policy recommendation we made um, and how that, how the implications of those suggestions across the range of groups that all of us had insights into was really important. So I think the collectivity, uh, the collective accountability was a really one really important part of it. Um, and that's something that we have to think about how to preserve after this kind of now this moment of, you know, urgency where everybody just kind of mucked in um, has passed. The second thing that we have really found important is co-production. And by, uh, so we did a lot of research on, I, I work for an organization called SHM Foundation and we have done and do a lot of co-production in HIV and mental health research in Southern Africa. Um, so I ha have quite a lot of experience in using, like, as a practitioner, as opposed to a researcher, um, using participatory methodologies to design interventions. And so through that work, um, you know, I, I found that when I came to looking at what people were calling co-production in the UK was really strange because it was like this kind of consultative model where people like the kind of heads of communities came together in these quite, quite formal spaces. And that felt really wrong. And also the, the kind of, um, you know, only doing ethnography that didn't involve any participants voices did also felt really wrong. So, I actually had this really amazing conversation with a woman um, who actually spoke at one of our talks that you can listen to the podcast on online um, called Samira Benema. And she, she said to me, you know, when you invite a community to a space, then they will, well, a community member to a space, they'll perform what you want them to perform. So you have to get beyond that performance. The framing of the encounter is so important. So we relied on community-based organizations or key nodal figures like Samira to do that framing for us. Um, and sometimes it was possible, uh, you know, some situations were more fraught than others, right? And I think we had to be really careful about which ones of those situations were fraught. And in those instances, we knew we were not the right pe people to ask the questions. Um, in terms of feeding the information back, um, I think that we've also had a really interesting journey about finding allies within the civil service. Um, you know, we have some amazing who who kind of we don't have to do the the deep translation work, um, or who we are comfortable that they won't misconstrue our findings or conflate them. Or I mean, that's happened too. I've done a consultancy um, with the government last year that where the findings of a report I produced were uh, not, you know, I haven't seen them again and they've come out in strange ways. Um, but in other times, like for example, working with MHCLG, the team that Laura works with are really, and you can listen to them as well in that talk, you know, they're community activists themselves before they work for MHCLG. So I think finding those key collaborators has been really, really important. And the same went for the local authority situations and realizing that if it wasn't the right collaborator, then you can do more harm than good, I think was another really important reflection for us. Yeah, thanks, Nikita. Would you put the link to that talk you mentioned in the chat? Yeah, totally, definitely. It's easy to find because um, yeah, yeah. I'd love to hear it as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're much more interesting than me. 
<laughs> I, I doubt that. <laughs> um, I have another question. Maybe I'll just jump in while, while no one else has their hand up. So I, as I mentioned before, we kind of let everyone into the room. I've been doing some writing about stigma and some, I mean, my background is philosophy, so it's all very theoretical, but one of the, um, one of the papers I, I've just read is by a philosopher called Phil Hutchinson, who's worked a lot around stigma and HIV and shame and HIV. And, and like one of the lines in the paper I just read was stigma presents a puzzle for the researcher who might reasonably expect to find their phenomena in the wild. Stigma is both everywhere and yet it can be difficult to find. And the point he makes in that paper is that stigma is this category term that's kind of been invented and deployed by academics and researchers, but actually isn't something that shows up in the lived experience of ordinary people who, who don't have theoretical or academic leanings. And it's not, the, it's not, the language of stigma isn't the language that ordinary people deploy to describe their experiences. So it becomes like kind of an, uh, an umbrella term to describe for theorists, a range of different phenomena that kind of manifest in, in the wild, so to speak. And I wonder what you think of that, because it sounds like your research has kind of circled around stigma in your PhD and in this present work and how you, uh, what what is stigma for you guys? Um, <laughs> define stigma. And um, and is that, was that your experience speaking in doing this ethnographic work? Like were people using the language of stigma or were they talking about discrimination, racism, labeling, stereotyping, marginalization, like these other phenomena that are usually put under the umbrella of stigma? Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. It was a really great moment of realization actually for, for me. Um, I mean, I think Laura already knew this, but for me as personally as a researcher, when I was kind of finishing my PhD and writing this, um, introductory chapter about forms of I, I worked with a tribal community in North India who'd also experienced this kind of very rapid shift in livelihood so they were living through a moment of rupture and I was I kind of was looking at the kind of very embodied um, uh, forms of exclusion and mutuality that articulated various forms of class caste and tribal and gender difference in this community so I was kind of writing about that at the same time as I was writing about how stigma was playing out in Leicester and you know there were so many in both those contexts, nobody, hmm, that's not totally true. I'll come back to that. But people didn't discuss those forms of avoidance as stigma. Um, but as I was saying to you before, Luna, before this, uh, we opened the room, you know, I was looking at these forms of uh, exclusion, you know, why, di why did we not, when I, when I moved into this community, why was I not allowed as a young Punjabi woman to go to that part of the village? You know, why did this friend not come to dinner when I settled in a low caste household and rented a room there. You know, these kind of unarticulated forms of exclusion that bubble just below the surface and then erupt in these kind of moments of kind of direct exclusion or even blame or hatred. Um, often in the COVID situation, the idioms that we heard were mainly around um, safety. So that's what safety and like, where do I feel safe? I don't feel safe. Those people are um, unsafe they, they, or they don't understand or they're not following the rules, whereas these people do. But I think what was really interesting was that what we realized as a group was that every, you know, we were doing that, like we were deciding who comes into your house and who doesn't. And in the same way, when I moved to the village in India, I found myself avoiding certain areas. I didn't really know why, you know, but somebody had told me it's kind of not safe to go there. So, you know, I think that really careful, fine-grained ethnographic perspective can pick up on those very subtle forms of avoidance and, and perceptions of safety. Now, I think in COVID, because it was such a kind of acute and is still such a kind of acute uh, situation, those avoidances, as I was saying to Arthur, you know, are amplified or crystallized in these complex symbols. So these kind of conversations about certain spaces or people come to stand for um, a way in which these intersecting rhythms of avoidance kind of um, come together in a particular way or they take shape around a certain thing. So in the village, it was like an accusation of witchcraft, right? You know, the woman across the road was a low caste widow and she was also accused of witchcraft. In COVID, it was like those people don't wear masks. So, you know, I went back to reading Mary Douglas and and read about kind of purity and danger and why do people avoid certain 
people and not others, you know, um, I started looking at rumors, like what are the rumors that people are circulating around in, in Leicester, you know, how do they compare to these rumors that people circulated about young women in, in a village in India? So, so for me, those two projects really developed um, hand in hand. And I think what Laura really, Laura's work is primarily on time more recently. So she really has a very, and she's trained in history as well as anthropology. So she has a very sophisticated perspective on how those relations are not structural, but they're temporal. Um, uh, and kind of how we can look at the ways in which they shift subtly um, uh, according to different chronicities and why those different chronicities exist and why they can exist all at the same time. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a, yeah, it's a wider theoretical project, but definitely the kind of theoretical roots for, for it, of it for us are in South Asian literature on the biomoral. Yeah, Cornelia, go ahead. Thanks, Lena. Thanks, Nikita. That was a really great talk. Really enjoyed that. Thanks very much. I'm an um, anthropologist by background as well, oh, but great. I don't at all work around COVID or stigma. Um, but yeah, super fascinating. I was just uh, listening, sort of, I guess, more from a lay perspective, since this is not, not my research area. I was just thinking, um, you mentioned a bit the domestic, and in many ways, this is about different groups and neighborhoods. Um, but I was just thinking if there was an experience or if they were comfortable to talk about this, the kind of more, um, you know, domestic within families, kind of if there were new raptures or new um, ideas of stigma or avoidance within what might have been uh, relationships that were those of trust and where you feel you know, within those you are safe. And, and I'm just thinking personally, you know, a lot of us talk about how within our own families, oddly COVID uncovered sort of tensions that somehow we thought we were all politically on the same side. We all thought we have the same ideas around, I don't know, health or how we want to take care of our parents. I have so many friends where we talked about the different siblings just somehow, you know, handled COVID in subtly different ways that then, we thought of each other we might have put our parents in danger or that's not the right way to you know behave with in a private space or who you meet first before you come into a private space all these kind of strange tensions that haven't surfaced before and I was just wondering if they spoke a bit about that as well that there were kind of what might have been sort of your safe relations and the ones where you already had this kind of um, mm. longer Absolutely. sort of yeah <laughs> Absolutely, Cornelia. And, and you've kind of picked up on, I suppose, the other side of this paper. Uh, Anishka Giwala and I are writing a paper on South Asian kinship networks and stigma and how basically, um, you know, you have this kind of intense relational labor that people are doing about deciding who is a, a risky and who's not and how that impacts their private space and that kind of management of risk we found often fell to women you know women were the ones who would decide mothers were deciding who because they were in our intellectual words often the glue figures so they were the ones who were receiving the information processing the information and then deciding how what that meant for their domestic space and their kind of social role I'm speaking for South Asian women at the moment um there but I think it, it, it's meaningful across different social groups um but uh their social role and role in the household is to do that boundary making you know to um, and I think that plays out in deciding who's allowed in, who's allowed out, um, in who, you know, uh, uh, hygiene work, in kind of sanitizing kids, in, you know, um, you know, where you go shopping, all of these decisions became this new form of labor that people took on. Um, I think though, what was really, really interesting um, was how people were some people were visible and some people were invisible in that process of boundary making. So for example, um, uh, there was, I think it was at the end of the first wave or in the second, the, the November lockdown, like there were, one was allowed to have a cleaner, but one wasn't allowed to have a grandmother in for childcare, right? And this was a huge, like, like why, you know, is it 
is it because a cleaner's life is less valuable than a grandmother's life? Is it because care was kind of stigmatized in a way that um, an economic relation was not? So, you know, we, we talked a lot as a group about, you know, the way in which money disinfected um, kind of relationships in that that process of boundary making um but yeah i mean watch this space for hopefully something that's going to come out on that soon yeah thanks Nikita. i think that's a really like insightful comment that money disinfected certain relationships because the, the inconsistencies in those sorts of rules and regulations during last year were were astonishing and yeah and completely head-wrecking like you just couldn't understand mm -hmm. why this and not that and why that and not this um so mm -hmm. there's a lot to learn from that I think um I have another question but is there anyone else before I um okay I'll just carry on I could actually talk to you all day so <laughs> it's great we have an audience one of the things you mentioned in your talk was like the problematic nature of the BAME category and, and, and obviously your analysis was much fine grained in terms of the different communities, ethnicities and, and kind of racial groups that you guys were working with. And I wonder, I, I mean, I just want to hear your reflections on, on that category and how it was mobilized uh, or how it has been and continues to be mobilized during the COVID pandemic as a way to understand demographics and inequalities and so on and, you know, yeah, I'd just love to hear what you, mm, how mm. that came up for your participants and how it came up for you guys as researchers. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a very interesting conversation that we're still having at the moment, actually, because um, if you, in our first report, we have a big spotlight on the BAME category and what people told us about it. So you can read that there. I mean, mainly what we talk about there is that basically people totally rejected that category. I mean, they found it absolutely homogenizing they found it othering they found it to uh, elide all sorts of differences and people were really really keen on making um very kind of strong statements about how they differed from other people um within their communities or within the nation um you know and uh and often that was related to class as well or sit like kind of citizenship or migration um so yeah it was a it was a kind of it was felt to be a very aligning category and i think that was really intensified with the publication of the seawall report um and but at the same time, I think people realized and people know that they need evidence related to their community's plight in order to make demands of government. So, um, you know, people argued for like, so I was in a lot of these kind of community briefings in Ealing, you know, about how the pandemic was playing out in the in the third wave. And, you know, people were consistently asking for disaggregations of data and for kind of you know more specific studies of people's needs and and I think that was a really important voice that we need to listen to um uh you know as we come out of this pandemic and as we you know and, and the question of how to do that is is very difficult I think it's something that we're bringing into this Periscope project, which is kind of very interdisciplinary and pan-European. But what we've realized in entering into that project is that all of these collaborators work in countries around Europe where actually no ethnic, no data on ethnicity has been collected at all around COVID. So there's no evidence around inequal, unequal impact of COVID uh, related to ethnicity, because, for example, in France, um, ethnicity data is, in a, is it's against the law to collect it in relation to death. And, um, you know, that's deeply related to ideas of laicite and the state. I mean, I don't know that much about it, but um, we've just been really struck from a kind of researcher's perspective on the fact that the UK and maybe there's like one or two other countries who've actually collect, collected ethnicity data. Um, so that makes the UK a really interesting case study for how COVID has played out across different inequalities um, uh, and for kind of making those inequalities visible in order to make demands for investment in social infrastructures. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, we, we tried, it, it has all sorts of implications, like in our second survey that we ran in May, we decided not to ask people to specify their, their ethnicity, like we decided them to ask them to self-define their ethnicity. And that totally didn't work either. I mean, we just 
that the kind of range of scales on which people um, uh, define their ethnicity was so incommensurable that it was very difficult to disaggregate for any particular group um, and to make any assumptions about ethnicity at all. So we've written also about those challenges in our second report. So we don't know yet. Um, you know, as ethnographers, I don't think we're the best people to answer this question, but I think that's the value of ethnography and kind of, yeah, really understanding what those categories mean in people, the, you know, the social life of those categories and when people choose to use them in order to make certain claims and when they are really um, problematic. Yeah, thanks for those reflections. It's, it's something we're grappling with, I guess, for, for our UK IHRC project, we're co-writing a, a book and one of the chapters addresses, um, I guess, stigma, shame and racism during COVID. And, and it's one of the, the questions that has come up for us in terms of how all of the data has been presented around health inequalities is through this BAME category and how that actually lands with the individuals who are experiencing these health inequities and inequalities. So, um, and, and that tension precisely that you highlight that it's both harmful, but empowering if, if it's going to give you a voice with policymakers um, mm -hmm. to deploy those categories. So yeah, it's something we've been thinking through as well. Fred, I feel like you should ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, um, I was going to put my hand up anyway, thanks, Lena. Um, but, um, I, I think I was, I was quite interested to know, um, or to hear you say a little bit more about how some of these kind of experiences of, of stigmatisation and avoidance, um, how they're kind of experienced, or if they're experienced unevenly uh, within, uh, kind of within communities, so kind of I was thinking about, I suppose, youth and age and things like that, and kind of where this sort of shame lands, um, and kind of, but there, there might be other ways as well. So mm. I wonder if you could talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And this is kind of what we what we kind of tracked across these care maps, kind of thing. So, you know, um, so for example, to take young people as an example, we tracked the and we're tracking as, at the moment working with a group of young people um how the relations of stigma you know what what were the narratives about young people in Leicester um you know being recalcitrant not following rules you know being spreading the virus how that was fed by certain kind of ways of data being presented about where infection was circulating um with what age groups um with what demographics and then that really contrasted to interviews we did with young people themselves who kind of had taken on all of these new relations of care you know they and, and who were thinking about those kind of forms of um, uh, avoidance that they had to play out in order to keep their elders safe, right? You know, so many young people became carers during the pandemic. So many young people um, ended up doing, um, you know, all sorts of kind of um, domestic labor in because their parents or grandparents were vulnerable. Um, so you see this kind of double movement, right? Where young people were um, uh, uh, stigmatized, um, but they were also um, invited to these new roles of carers and given all of these new responsibilities. And I think making visible those, you know, how that caused mental distress um, in a lot of young people is really important. Like there's a really great study that's just been uh, done by the REACH group at um, KCL uh, that a friend of mine, Gina, has worked on where she did, you know, 50 interviews with a group of young people um, uh, at three different stages of the pandemic and they kept a diary and uh, you know the kind of very complex considerations around how they should behave what they were sacrificing what their role was in their family you know that was stigma for them that was that was these kind of yeah like a like a, a problematization of all of their kind of relationships and their social role and a full kind of disruption of their future that was really hidden behind this narrative of um, non-compliance or rule breaking. Yeah, Arthur, go ahead. Yeah, this is um, maybe uh, to, to build on that last point about the young people like in this, this, um, um, I did, it, it, you know, possibly because of the work that we're doing, almost say a shame sensitive response where it's anticipating the possibility of a, of 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 putting a 
a step wrong or putting you know the wrong thing or saying the wrong thing um and i guess i i suppose one thing that i didn't hear as much in your talk maybe just missed it but which i'd like i'd sort of want you to expand on is if we think of that response by young people is potentially fueled by, but not necessarily fueled by, um, increased social media presence, and particularly with the notion that online spaces have a tendency to um, create lasting footprint, footprints for people in, in terms of what they say and what they do, or have the potential to, to kind of uh, be taken to extremes. Um, I was just wondering whether whether social how social media came up in these kind of um, interviews in and how um, sort of responses to social media kind of created, I guess, a blended environment in which the virtual and the, for want of a better word, I guess, the in person concrete um started to create feedback loops in which mm -hmm. stigma that was related to online became stigma that was that was being kind of reported in person that was creating potential for online stigma etc 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 yeah yeah absolutely and, and the reverse as well i think um i think so i suppose social media came up for us in two kind of really important ways, which we write about both in the recent report. Um, the first way is, is what you're saying, particularly we looked at South Asian communities and WhatsApp groups and the spread of misinformation, particularly in the early days of the, um, particularly in 2020 um, around COVID and then again in 2021 around the vaccine and how, you know, these kind of particularly South Asian groups um, uh, engaged in, were engaged in WhatsApp groups that had a lot of kind of rumor, you know, going around and different kind of content. And, and I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure you've seen that, that kind of content that circulates, but then how that gets kind of put through a mill of conversation and, you know, then gets fed back through, as I said, those kind of glue figures to the household and how the household then debates it and how that debate then produces certain forms of avoidance in everyday life. So I think following that flow is really interesting um, and it's really clarifying to think about it as you, as you put it. But also, we also looked at the potential of social media as a really amazing positive space for, um, uh, for kind of pushing back against stigma. And this is particularly in things like the Stop Asian Hate campaign that um, Anishka Giwala has written a really great spotlight on in our recent report um, and that what she looks at the idea that, um, you know, this, the stigma that her community, that the Asian, particularly East Asian communities experienced, um, and East Asian communities who didn't necessarily live in an enclave, you know, they didn't live in a single geographic area, but they were experiencing stigma all the same, you know, they didn't have anyone to talk to about it, um, that they were invited to a new form of mutuality and community that pushed back against that stigma through the Stop Asian Hate campaign. And she writes really beautifully about the kind of potential of social media as a as a form of social movement that invites a different kind of radical community um, and and kind of pushes back against those stigmatizing relationships. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's a blended environment in some cases, but also, you know, you can kind of have these parallel worlds that offer these different forms of subjectivity. And I think that's a really interesting thing to look at, you know, and Actually, the thing that I work on with the SHM Foundation is um, virtual support groups. So we run virtual support groups for mainly young people living with HIV. And, um, and you know, what we find amazing about these virtual support groups is that they are intimate, anonymous spaces run on a very carefully curated platform where these young people who are living with a deeply stigmatized condition are able to discuss Thing, things like disclosure, things like uh, intimate sexual relationships, you know, uh, in an entirely different space where they are an entirely different person, you know, they have a kind of um, a pseudonym and, you know, they have these kind of online personas and that offers them a whole new different kind of subjectivity. I mean, in that instance, 
in the HIV context, people do use the word stigma. You know, people talk about stigma and the stigma they experience and they kind of have a strong language around that. And part of the groups is kind of, you know, personalizing that language and allowing it to relate to instances that they experience or anticipate in their communities and things like that. So I think it's a really, it's, it's both powerful and kind of, yeah, problematic. Um, thanks, Nikita. Yeah, I was just thinking how interesting that is that the HIV community has the language of stigma, but that makes a lot of sense because of the you know the activism that's been going on for decades around overcoming the stigma associated with it. And um, just well, we've kind of run out of time, so I just wanted to ask one question about that work that the HIV communities in Southern Africa, like, have have you been working with them throughout COVID, and has there been a particular intersection of COVID stigma with HIV stigma, or have have those things not intertwined in any significant way? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They have. Yeah. And and kind of, yeah, uh, you know, th they um, so I work in Zimbabwe and in South Africa and in Zambia and the ways in which COVID and HIV have intersected have been very different for different groups I work with. So I work may all with young people, but some are young mothers, some are young men, you know, and and um, I think it's. I think it's been really interesting to look at how those forms of stigma intersect, but also how they're very different kinds of stigma where HIV stigma is related to a certain stigmatized persona or, um, you know, figure in uh, uh, who invites moral panic um, around sexual promiscuity, for example, um, the stigma of COVID is is a more kind of subtle form of everyday avoidance. Um, so I think that a lot more thinking needs to go on about what the difference between those constellations of stigma are. I mean, when they intersected, it was mainly around accessing certain spaces. So for example, um, young people who had to go to the hospital to pick up their meds were then um, uh, potentially been to an exposing site and then kind of you know or I work with a lot of young people who are like peer educators or community champions and they had a role where they had to you know that it was a very exposing job because they had to kind of engage with their participants in the community and that was stigmatizing so I think yeah there were very different kinds of stigmas as they played out well, yeah thanks that's really interesting and um, we've just come to the end of the time we have so I want to end on time and just really thank you Nikita for your talk and also your really fascinating, interesting and insightful answers during the discussion. It's been like for Arthur, Fred and I, it's been amazing. <laughs> and I hope for everyone else as well. It really helps us. Um, it really informs the work we're doing on our project. And I think it's just so important. And, you know, the, these reflections about what we've just experienced in the, the last 18 months are just, you know, it's just so important for everyone in the UK. So thank you so much. Um, thank you with us. and this talk is being recorded so it will have a life online after this um and you know i'm sure it'll be watched by many other people alice will be in touch with you nikita to um show you the recording so you can have a look before it goes up um, so thank you so much again and lovely to see you and we'll be in touch soon great thank you thank you so much for having me and thanks for all for being here and great to see you laura as well um ex-lse person maybe okay take care everyone Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.